Okay, let's close the door. Okay. Let me see if everybody Good morning, Good morning. We're uh, going to chant the vows today. Um, Blake is going to share the screen and we'll chant along with you silently while you chant out loud. <clears throat> I can hear you very well. I think you're breaking up or something. Okay. I'm just saying, well, we can chant the vows whenever you're ready. We'll chant along with you silently. Okay. You chant. Okay. An unsurpassed, <clears throat> penetrating, and perfect Dharma <clears throat> is rarely met with, even in a hundred thousand million kalpas. Having it to see and listen to, to remember and accept. I vow to taste the truth of the Tathagata's words. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? You? No. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes, I need an answer. <laughs> Well, uh, good morning. This morning, uh, when I was offering incense, I was offering incense um, uh, for the um, victims of the uh, um, uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki atomic bomb uh, incident, um, which is the two days ago was the seventieth, seventy fifth anniversary, if you want to call it that, um, of um, the atomic bomb on uh, those two cities. <clears throat> so um, I think that uh, enthusiasm for that, for um, commemorating that e those two events uh, is fading. And so I wanted to uh, remind us. I'm sure many of us are reminded already, but I did uh, want to remind us and to offer our uh, condolences um, to those victims and hope that this doesn't happen again. So please get out and vote. Um, uh, I was talking with Ron, Mr few days ago, last week, about um, uh, what we call the, the three Dharma seals of Buddhism. Uh, and there are two versions. So the most common version is like, goes like this. Um, uh, the th the th a Dharma seal means this is the stamp of Buddha. This is this is true. This is truth. So these are the, the three truths of our existence, sometimes called uh, the three marks. Um, mark, uh, you know, when we uh, read the the plat the um, uh, Prajnaparamita Sutra, um, we. Um, it says, uh, the true mark of all dharmas is emptiness. Um, so I'll go back to that. So, uh, but I want to sit, tell you what, uh, remind you of what the three marks of the three dharma seals are. Um, the th first one is everything changes, uh, which is called impermanence. The second one, the order is sometimes switched. Um, uh, the second one is called, there is no abiding self in anything. And the third one, uh, in one version, is called uh, suffering. So everything changes. 
there is no self in things, no abiding self or lasting self in things, and everything is suffering. That's one version. Uh, the other version is um, everything changes. Um, there is no abiding self in things, in anything. And the third one is everything is living in nirvana. So take your pick. The old version is much more popular because, um, uh, for some reason, uh, and when you say that the third Dharma seal or the third um, mark is uh, nirvana, people raise their eyebrows. Nirvana? No, it's suffering. Um, so uh, let's take a look at this. These three. Of existence. Basically, challenge is not like these two versions are. Uh, but and that's good. It's good that they're controversial. So it's undisputable that everything changes. Um, uh, the last time I was in this room, it looks just like it. Uh, it, it looks just like it is now. It doesn't look like anything has changed. Changed. It's not the same place. Just like choppiness. Choppiness? Just like choppiness. Yeah. We're going to fix the choppiness, maybe. Let's try this. So, um, uh, but everything in this room has changed, even though I can't uh, discern it. Um, and the person that you see before you, do you remember that guy back 50 years ago? <laughs> he has changed as well, even though it's the same. Everything changes as well as it remains the same. <laughs> so, uh, the no self in beings is indisputable, even though people have various ideas about it. But when you really investigate, you will see that uh, not only does everything change, but uh, uh, we are not the same person exactly as we were five minutes ago, in some way, even though we relate to each other as if nothing has changed. So these two uh, factors are somewhat indisputable. It, uh, you can you can argue about them and present logical, you know, or illogical. Uh, feelings about them, but um, nothing is permanent. From one moment to the next, every single moment, everything is changing. So since everything is changing, we can't say that um, I am immortal, because we are all mortal, given to um, uh, um, transformations. It's called the, the world of transformations. That's all there is, is transformations. 
and we try to glue everything together, you know, and, and uh, wish that everything that things um, were different, but that's that's the way it is. So, the third a mark or the third dharma seal, uh, you have you have to take a close look at everything is suffering. Um, it's not that everything is suffering. Suffering exists and is very common to all beings. But it's not a permanent, it's not something that, uh, you know, it, it, it's always changing and is a psychological phenomenon. Suffering is a psychological phenomenon. Pain is pain, dislike is dislike and so forth. But um, uh, what we add to it is suffering. I can have a painful feeling, but it's not necessarily suffering. It's only suffering when I don't like it or don't want it. Think about that. Please take this away. Then it's become suffering. There are three kinds of suffering or more, but categories. Um, one category is that suffering, um, uh, it, you hit your thumb with a hammer, right? And, and that's suffering. I mean, that's a, a cause for suffering, condition for suffering. Um, or, you know, you can think of a million um, things that are conditions for suffering, but um, they don't have to be. Whereas the other two are immutable. They have to be. So there's some doubt about if suffering is really the third Dharma seal. Um, so instead of suffering, we say Nirvana, because Nirvana uh, is immovable, so to speak. It's always present, no matter what. So Nirvana is, is a, a mysterious thing. We don't talk about it very much. Oh, Nirvana, that, oh, you know, who can, who can reach Nirvana? Only a Buddha can reach. No, that's not so. Nirvana is our, our most, the closest thing to us, closer than hands and feet, as it says. Nirvana is our true self which we experience every day. It's our everydayness. Just like change is our everydayness, no self, no abiding self is uh, everydayness. And nirvana is everydayness when we allow it to, I don't want to say appear, appear because things are apparent. Apparent. Uh, nirvana is our, our, our true self. But we think of, you know, reaching nirvana as some great feat. Only Buddhists can do this, and so we don't bother with it because it's too mysterious. <laughs> but it's not mysterious. We have to demysterialize de nirvana. Zazen is how we recognize nirvana. When we sit zazen, we recognize nirvana. everything drops away. So when everything drops away, what's left is nirvana. So that's why sitting zazen is so wonderful. We let everything drop away. Things come and go and, and zazen, you know, everything comes and goes, flotsam and jetsam of our brain and our feelings and so forth. <clears throat> but um, uh, nirvana is just our fundamental self, unbared, naked, our naked self. So, Nirvana is naturally the third Dharma seal, 
because it, it can't be eliminated and it's constant. And when we allow ourselves, when we take off the coverings of ourselves, what's left is nirvana. It's a leftover. <laughs> But, but that's what Buddhists, you know, survive on leftovers. It's, it's true. You know, the original Buddhist robes were um, uh, rags, menstrual rags, rags from a, from a, 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 a carnal ground, uh, rags that were used to wipe up you know, poop and vomit and the worst possible, I mean, the, the, the most stinky um, rags were suitable <laughs> for robes, <laughs> Buddhist robes. Uh, so they, <clears throat> the monk would wash the robes, I mean, wash the rags, and um, uh, sew them together. And they were beautiful. It was like redemption, redeeming what's been thrown away. Um, uh, the ultimate ecology. <clears throat> um, So I, I, I want to talk a little bit about each one of those Dharma seals. Oh, but I want to also want to get back to what is meant by a mark. <clears throat> in the, in the uh, Heart Sutra, it says, um, the true mark of all dharmas is emptiness. Actually, nirvana. But what a mark means is it's characteristic. Um, the characteristic of fire is heat. The characteristic of water is wet. That characteristic of earth is solid solidity. And the uh, the the mark of um, uh, uh, air is um, uh, ethereal, ethereality. Um, but the true mark of all dharmas is emptiness. The true characteristic of every single thing is emptiness. And emptiness has 20 meanings. <laughs> but the meaning that's most important for us is um, interdependence, because nothing has its own um, uh, 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 independent existence, even though everything exists independently. You know, we have to be very careful, because truth is not one-sided. Whichever, whatever we encounter, has a, a, uh, a momentary existence and a total existence. That's Buddhism, Buddhist understanding. And it, we are always falling into one side or the other. And that's what creates arguments. You can say everything is and you can also say everything isn't. And they're both true. These are the kind of arguments that people had, that Buddhists had <clears throat> in, during the 20s school period, before the first century. The 20, 20 uh, school period lasted for about 400 years, where, where the Buddhists had all these arguments about what was, which is good, you know, very good for them to um, 
discuss all this stuff. But it's all been discussed out. <laughs> it's all disgusting. It's all... <laughs> um, um, this is a guru, she said. I re recently read where he said, um, everything's already, in Buddhism, everything's already been done. <laughs> all you have to do is read about it. <laughs> so the mark of um, uh, uh, a person is um, uh, uh, no special self, no abiding self. Although there is a self, if we say there's no self, that's that's only half. The other half is there is a self. Otherwise, who is talking about no self? <clears throat> the one who's talking about <clears throat> no self is the self. And the one who's talking about self is the non-self. So we're both self and non-self at the same time. Um, you know, Buddhism uses little examples they say one thing to mean to include all everything they're talking about. So they say no self. But that doesn't, but no self has to include a self. Otherwise, what are we talking about? <laughs> you can't talk about a hammer without a hammer being there. We didn't make this up. But our salvation is realizing that there is no abiding self in ourself. But what does that mean? How can we exist in this way? Well, we are earthlings. But I, I, and all you have to do is look at nature to see how everything exists. And we are a part of nature. Um, there are schools which claim that we are not a part of nature. And they're ruining the earth because what the heck? But we are definitely a part of nature. And so our true self is the whole universe. When we realize our whole self is that our true self is the whole universe, because there is no specific self that is abiding, um, then we. Um, can flow with change. We can flow, you know, we used to say, go with the flow. Oh yeah, that's just hippie stuff. Well, there's some, the hippies said it right in a lot of ways. Look what's happening, you know, without the help of the hippies today. <laughs> the hippies tried to, to uh, um, put us on the right track. Everything is constantly changing. And this was one of Suzuki Roshi's main teaching, among other main teachings. His main teaching was everything changes. And the, the only thing that doesn't change is change itself. The only thing that doesn't change is change itself. So that is a constant. That's why it's a Dharma seal. And the other thing is human, our, our, our human being, like um, animals all over the world, um, uh, are always you know, at the same time we're growing, we're dying. We're living and dying at the same time. <laughs> Being born and dying at the same time, moment by moment. That's why we can say that we are alive, because we're also dead. If we weren't dead, we couldn't be alive. So. Why would we worry about that? 
Do we cling to life? Of course. We cling, you know, uh, because that's where we are. And, and we uh, are a part of this uh, world where so-called life is undesirable and death is undesirable. But for Buddhists, birth and death are the same thing. They're just two sides of the one coin. So Buddhist practice, the goal of Buddhist practice is to understand this. You know, it's called the great matter, the great matter of birth and death. I don't call it life and death because life is includes death and death includes life. So they're not really opposites. The more, what I feel is more opposites is birth and death. Birth is inhalation and death is exhalation. And without, without death, you can't come back to life. So we're coming, we're being born and dying at the same time. At the same time. If it isn't a dichotomy, it's not truth. So we live in we actually have a dualistic world, which is one-sided, pretty much. We live in a dualistic world that's one-sided, like a glass. You know, we're on one side of the glass, and we think um, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a hemisphere, but actually it's a whole sphere, <laughs> because we're only looking at one side of the glass, but the glass is one whole piece, and birth and death is one whole piece. And the older you get, the more you think about this. <laughs> when, when you're not so old, you know, you don't think about it, you think, well, you're going to live forever, you know, you don't even think about it. Oh yeah, dying, oh yeah. That. <laughs> but when you get to a certain age, you realize that there's a there's a there's an ending, but and then you you add it up. Well, let's see. Ten years, nine, eight, seven, six, five, or whatever. <laughs> so nirvana is is understanding this and living and uncovering your true nature. Poor Nirvana really takes a beating, but it's okay. <laughs> so, uh, we don't have to see Nirvana as, although it's a great mysterious thing, it really is a great mysterious, it's a great mystery, but at the same time, it's under our hands and feet, it's, it's right there. It's when we, it's called seeing things as it is. It's like you should call it seeing things as it is. Nirvana. When we do that, instead of seeing things through our imagination, imagination is really important for human beings. It's great. So we have to get our imagination straightened out so that uh, it doesn't interfere with, with, um, uh, the naked truth. If we practice satsang for a long time uh, without trying to break to, to make it into something, um, nirvana will become apparent at some point. 
and you won't have to worry anymore. I would say nirvana is non-clinging. It's sometimes, you know, you can't describe it. It's not something describable, but you can use various images to look at it. Um, like um, when everything is dropped, that's nirvana. Because there's nothing hindering its expression. But it appears in everything we do. It's kind of like salt in the ocean. It's, it's just there as part of the ocean. Um, as a matter of fact, the, the uh, example of the ocean is, is a, a viable example for um, uh, nirvana. The waves are our activity, and nirvana is the ocean in which our waves exist. Our waves are part of the are, are the ocean. <laughs> And the ocean is the waves, but each ocean, each wave is an individual. Oh, there's, there's John wave, there's Mary wave. And the, none of the waves are permanent, <laughs> but they all belong to the ocean. The ocean is their source. So what more, what more could we want? When we realize that the ocean, that the waves are the, are the are, are the ocean, uh, that's nirvana. So the nirvana basically means dropping. Or renunciation is another term that's used. Uh, what is renunciation? Well, it means dropping our uh, false sense of self. When manas turns, it becomes the wisdom of equality, which is nirvana. So instead of talking about nirvana, we usually talk about um, letting go of ego or transforming ego. Transforming ego into nirvana. Um, you know, uh, regarding no self, the diamond sutra as I remember, has a statement that says, um, we vow to save all beings, all living beings, even though there are no living beings to be saved. That's a wonderful koan to chew on. We're bound to save all of the beings, even though there are no living beings to be saved. I, I would do you a great disservice if I took that apart and explained it. So, um, dealing with this um, 
uh, with these three uh, marks or three dharma seals of existence um, is a very deep and all of, I think all of Buddhism, all of Buddhist understandings come from this, these three um, fundamental truths. And you should tear them apart if you want, you know. You should, if, you, if, if, if it disturbs you, you should really attack them and dig deeply in and see if you can prove them wrong. That's Buddhism. See if you can prove them wrong. You can't prove that suffering is not a constant. Because otherwise there would be nothing called joy. Although we say joy, uh, joy is a constant. Even though we don't always experience it as a constant. In the same way, you can say that suffering is a constant, even though we don't always experience it as a constant. Uh, joy and suffering actually can be one thing. You know, we always appreciate somebody who's, who has a lot of physical problems and a lot of suffering, so-called, and can smile through their suffering can help other people while they're suffering. You know, that's um, noble practice. We call the four truths, four noble truths. And we call the Buddha the noble one. Because the noble one takes in all the suffering of people and smiles. And doesn't complain. And helps other people. And suffers the suffering of all people. Actually, without suffering, we can't have any wisdom. Our wisdom has not, we can't open our wisdom mind until we uh, suffer the suffering of beings, of all beings. So, um, in regard to the third Dharma seal, you can say suffering, <clears throat> uh, suffering within nirvana and nirvana within suffering. Nirvana and suffering go together. Within, with, without suffering, nirvana doesn't open up. This is the key to opening up. Nirvana is through your suffering. That's constant. Constancy. So we could say everything uh, is changing. There is no abiding self in a person, in an individual person. And uh, nirvana within suffering and suffering within nirvana. And um, uh, 
I, I want to uh, go back to um, no self, no, no uh, inherent self, we call it, because everything is connected to everything else and doesn't exist without everything else. You know, I remember you, you're probably familiar with um, Thich Nhat Hanh talking about uh, a table is all, uh, you have a nice table in the middle of the room and the table is all made of elements that are not the table. Without all the other elements that are not the table, the table doesn't exist. Just like a human being. Without all the elements, they're not you. <laughs> they make you <laughs> into what you are because you're just one particle of the whole being. We are all one particle of the whole being for a moment. So, um, uh, even though I don't exist, <laughs> uh, uh, please treat me as if I do. <laughs> so, do you have any questions? I'm happy to, uh, I, I don't know what the question thing, I think the question thing is supposed to come after the talk. Oh, it is time for the end of the talk probably, right? I need somebody to tell me. Yeah, um, Sojin Roshi, would you like to entertain one question before I make the announcements? That's okay. Okay, anybody have a question? Oh, it looks like um, Ross has his hand up. Hi, Ross. I don't see your hand, but. Good morning, Sojin Roshi, and thank you so much for that lovely talk and the spin on uh, Nirvana and samsara. So, yes. uh, and suf suffering, yes. suffering and Nirvana. So yes. I'm thinking about the four noble truths. Uh, the first truth is suffering. The second is there's an origin. The third is cessation. And the fourth is the eightfold path leading to cessation of suffering. Can you reword the four noble truths using um, Nirvana? instead of suffering? Does it have the same resonance for us in practice? Or is this from the Theravada an old way of looking at it, an original way of looking at it, and not so appropriate to reword it? Well, I don't think you... Uh, what was the third one? Uh, the cessation of suffering, freedom from craving. Well, the third one, uh, as I understand it, is that there is a way to deal with so-called suffering. Mm -hmm. And it's suffering is, you know, uh, suffering is one term that covers the various um, dissatisfactions in our life. So rather than naming all the dissatisfactions in our life, the term suffering is used. But it's, it can be anything, right? So let's take the, the, the stereotype which is called suffering, okay. And there's a cause, that's the second one. What is the cause of our unease? Or what is the cause of our delusion? Or what is the cause of our um, misunderstandings? And what is the cause of, you know, all, all kinds of um, uh, unwholesomeness? You can say, um, sentient beings are a subject to. That's what I usually use the term subject to. Um, we're subject to suffering. We're subject to misunderstanding. We're just subject to um, uh, pain and, and we're subject to um, hate and ill will and greed and so forth. And the second one, the second noble truth is um, there's a there's a cause for all these things. This so Buddha is called the physician, and so he's stating the problems, 
that you have. And he's giving you the the uh, the medicine. Mm -hmm. Right? That so that's the, the four noble truths are divided into two and two. The first two are this is the problem, Doc. Please fix it. And he said, Okay, here's the medicine. So the problem is delusion and uh, that, that, that we actually um, uh, are, Ill, are ill at ease for various, various reasons. Life is uncomfortable. <laughs> and, the, and the second truth is, uh, well, there's a reason for that. And these are the reasons. Uh, being with people you don't want to be with, be, doing stuff you don't want to do, all the stuff that you don't like, you don't want, that causes suffering. Yes. And all the things that you do want, you don't have, and that causes suffering. That's a stereotype. Then the third truth is, well, here's that there is a way to deal with this problem. That's the third truth. There's a way to deal with this problem. And the way is the noble eightfold path, eightfold path the noble eightfold, eightfold path. What was your question? Well, in the re if one could reword the Four Noble Truths, like there's the truth of suffering, we could say there is the truth or we are subject to nirvana. There yeah. is it's not that we're subject to nirvana. Nirvana is the basis of our life. Okay. We're, and, we're subject to life. Yes, and that. There is an origin to nirvana. Instead of there's an origin or a source of suffering, well, nobody knows what the origin of nirvana is. <laughs> nirvana is just nirvana. Things are just what they are. But as you said earlier in Zazen, if we uh, let go and drop everything, then we have an ex we can we are inclined toward the experience of nirvana. Yeah. Nirvana becomes um, tangible. Tangible. Uh -huh. We become aware of our nirvana. Yes. Okay. I'm, everything's on the opposite side, you know, and I'm looking at this. Yeah. I'm looking for the, I'm looking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. I don't like that, my collar. I, I, like, I like to have it exposed. I heard a half an inch of Juban is, this, is the... Uh, yeah, that's, that's the preferred. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> we, we won't measure it today, but thank you very much for your talk. And yeah, Nirvana just is. Yes. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> it's the ground of our being. Indeed. Thank so you. So we, we see, we compare samsara to nirvana, right? Because what's bad? Well, but what's bad is samsara, and what's good is nirvana. <laughs> right. So the good and the bad are like this. The good and the bad are like this. The right and the wrong are like this. Nirvana and samsara are like this. The place where you find nirvana is within the suffering of samsara. And there's a movie coming out on this very topic. I'm sure there is. The good, sure. the bad, and the ugly. If the good and the bad are not resolved, samsara and nirvana, then it's ugly. And that's the life that we uh, suffer with. Yeah, <laughs> so be it. I mean, so be it. It is, it is so. <laughs> was that the was that the end of the? Um, yeah, I think it's time. <laughs> it's time to chant the four vowels. Uh, thank you. Okay.